Welcome back Nerglings. Today we're going to be discussing collecting theory, what it is, why it's important and how to apply it to the hobby. But before we start be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. So what is collecting theory? I've been collecting and painting miniatures for decades but it's only within the last five years or so that I've genuinely considered what I like to call collecting theory. I like to include a slice of this theory in each series and have done so since the start of building a Realms of Chaos army back in 2016. But what is collecting theory? Is it just a wishy-washy way of saying collect models that you like? Or is it a more completist attitude? Let's unpack the idea and see what we find. When I say collecting theory, what I mean to say is the way I collect miniatures, but it doesn't quite have such a nice ring to it as collecting theory. To get an idea of the way I collect miniatures, we need to look back at my collecting going way back and how this has changed throughout my life. I started collecting miniatures with Battle Masters in 1992 and used this box set as the basis for a few different armies. I had a large undead army made up of most of the Empire figures from the set bolstered by hero quest skeletons and mummies, the sorcerer and gargoyle. When I came across Space Crusade, I also then started a Chaos Renegade force and an Orc army. It is worth noting, this was early days. My painting was not a patch on what it is today. Most things were a shade of black or highlighted and a few details picked out. This I would consider collecting in its loosest form, i.e just amassing models and fighting battles with a selection of friends. In those early days I kept a running tally of the battles I fought and accrued quite a storied history for each army. Unfortunately I have since lost that transcript in multiple computer changes, transfers of data and reformats. Anyway, with the advent of Gorkamorka I added several box sets worth of models to my orcs and started buying up second-hand models from a local war game store called South Sea Models, where my friend Richard and his dad took me one weekend with some pocket money. It was there that I discovered a love of classically painted miniatures with glorious gloss coats of varnish. I would visit Games Workshop in this time, of course. However, I found it a lacklustre experience. The staff were rather too keen to make a sale and never interested in the thing I had just painted from years gone by. A common occurrence that is still borne out in my dealings with Games Workshop stuff today, on the rare occasion that I visit a store. As time went on, I started to acquire my friends' collections as they dipped out of the hobby. My friends Sam and Kieran, both selling me their Orcs, Tyranids and Space Marines. Note, I was still in the heady days of amassing as many miniatures as I could with little grand plan to actually paint them all. Some of them languished for years or even decades in my collection. The Tyranids found their way to my brother, whilst the Orcs found a home in my own Orc army. The Marines meanwhile got converted in part into Chaos Renegades. Once I'd secured a job and had some money coming in, I started to spend more time on the computer playing games and eventually competing in tournaments online. I left my miniatures here at this point for a while, boxed up and shoved under the bed, above the cupboard and in corners of my room at my parents' house. I wouldn't touch a miniature for another half a decade or so. I got caught up in work, games, dating, etc. I travelled extensively for a couple of years. It was only when I returned to the UK from this self-imposed exile that I picked up miniatures again in earnest. When I returned to the hobby, my collecting style had radically changed. Rather than picking up just about everything I could afford, or that fell in my lap, I went about methodically collecting all the Nurgle miniatures and proxies I could find. At the time, there were no 3D printers. Proxy models were invariably resin and cast by solo outfits that rarely lasted long so it was crucial to snap things up whenever and wherever they were found. I got some nice miniatures, but once again, 
or I'd end up leaving my collection behind when I started my new job. I got consumed by my work, and for a good year or so I didn't touch a miniature. That is, until I moved in with my then girlfriend in a rental a few miles from my work. We had an empty old loft space with a workbench that the owner called Tinkering Room. This was swiftly adopted and turned into the man cave from where legions were born. I would sell off a lot of my early collection, only keeping a few metal renegades and my orc collection. Foolishly thinking that I could simply start again with a new army and not let it get out of hand. In those early days, a decade ago or so, I was convinced I could keep my collecting under control. As usual, I was wrong. This time around I concentrated on collecting whole series or releases of miniatures. For instance, every Metal Plaguebearer model, including the unreleased versions, completing my Metal Chaos Renegade collection, each of the pre-slaughter releases of Chaos Warriors, and so on. Of course, my painting speed could never outpace my collecting. Before I knew it, I was drowning in lead and resin again. Having been to various places with work, I've had a couple of years worth of time over the last decade where I haven't been able to put brush to metal. But, all things considered, I've been quite consistent in my output. Then, in 2021, everything changed. I bought a house. With this new goal and drain on my resources, I promptly quit the collecting part of the hobby and started a whole new chapter, building and painting. Whilst I had been building and painting miniatures whilst collecting them, I would spend just as much time browsing for new miniatures as actually building and painting the ones I already had. This was a revelation. I got more miniatures painted that year than a good portion of my previous hobby career. Of course, the house isn't going anywhere and still needs money to keep it in a decent state, so I figured once I have paid off the house, I can get back to collecting. In the meantime, however, I have more than a couple of thousand figures to paint. So, as you can see, my hobby journey has played out in several quite distinct stages. The first, amassing anything and everything I could, followed by a distillation and consolidation around specific releases and collections. Then, a period of completion. I suspect this is quite a familiar story to many of you in some form or another. Everyone is different though, so each of these phases could be longer or shorter depending on the army, need or desire. Now, let's go on to why I think this matters. I think it's critical to your longevity in the hobby for you to realise in which stage you are currently in, in your hobby journey. If you can identify that you are simply in an amassing phase and for whatever reason enjoy purchasing miniatures, that's fine. Eventually you'll find you have collected enough. Once you come to the end of this phase you may feel overwhelmed or even resentful of the amount of money you paid or time you spent on something you no longer love. One of the great things about collecting miniatures though is that if you really need to offload them there is always someone willing to pay for them. Now you may not recover the full price you paid unless you are a particularly gifted painter or collector of particularly rare miniatures but you do have a good chance of at least recouping some of your losses. It's not all doom and gloom though a consolidation phase can be quite cathartic. You can figure out what you truly like about the miniatures you want to keep and this might spare you on to paint them or even start collecting once more. You might feel like you want to explore the lore of your collection, create art or otherwise be creative in a way complementary to the hobby. I myself don't really collect books or magazines anymore, instead choosing to concentrate on the creation of my own worlds and background, something which someday I would like to release as an alternative to regular wargaming. I think the key thing to note here is that you don't need to be bound to one manufacturer, which is what we will go on to look at next. 
One of the best things about the hobby is the sheer variety of miniatures available to us today. They can be categorised in a multitude of ways, style, scale, law, even the material they are made of. It's worth noting that this choice doesn't always have to be a choice. The release of Rogue Trader decades ago beautifully blended sci-fi and fantasy tropes in a glorious mess of style and colour. With that in mind, this is where I would like to start when talking about building armies. Building armies in the world of our choice is probably the main reason why we enjoy this hobby. A key component of this is the theme of your army. Is it a warband of misfits, a troop of travelling knights, a team of specialists or a horde of green idiots? You decide, but keep in mind several things when collecting. Scale. Scale isn't as important as some may think. The classic 172 scale for miniatures has long been a standard size. It equates to a 6 foot tall man being 25 millimetres tall. Other scales have hung their coat on this, such as Games Workshop's much loved heroic scale, which made heads and hands much larger and thus easier to paint. 28mm gave the heroically huge heads a more proportionate look, but let's stop there for a moment. What are we really concerned about when talking about the scale of miniatures? Most, I would suspect, would be worried about how these miniatures fit together in either a regiment or a unit of some kind. Interestingly, the difference between a 25mm and a 28mm model would be the same as a 6 foot man standing next to a 6 foot 8 man. Statistically, of course, there are far fewer 6 foot 8 men lurking about, but it's not outside the realm of possibility that they would serve together or be press ganged along with the other men in the village. So, if we take into account statistical outliers for size, you can see scale isn't that big of an issue. Style. Style is important. There are a few different ways to employ style in our collecting, and it can be employed in ways you may not have realised. For instance, several miniatures painted in different colours and wearing different garb may look all the more cohesive when standing on similarly decorated bases. Collecting a series of miniatures from different manufacturers and sculpting additional clothing, armour or weaponry on them can be a great project in an effort to bring them together in a style you wish to present them in. There is always disparity on purpose. The use of drastically different miniatures to promote a chaotic or disorganised feel to the unit or army. This can be used to great effect in horde armies like beastmen or orcs and goblins where madness runs rampant. So, again, style doesn't have to be an issue that limits your collecting either. Weaponry. Weaponry can be an issue. Now, if you play tournaments or have a competitive gaming group, you will want the correct weapons on your miniatures. The casual gamer or collector, on the other hand, may think nothing of arming his beastmen with a plethora of weapons that make no tactical sense. I like to try and keep units cohesive by arming them with the same or at least similar weapons. So a unit of Chaos Dwarves might be armed with great weapons. In this mix I would have anything that could be wielded with two hands, flails, axes, large swords and the like. In this way they automatically look like they are organised, whereas in my Beastmen army I have gore units with a mixture of weapons to emphasise their beastly nature. So, weapons can be important, if you deem them so. Design aesthetic. Another biggie. This can sometimes override other considerations. This can be perfectly summed up in the fact that there are numerous iterations of miniatures from edition to edition that have weapon changes but still have the iconography and design trappings of the previous edition. 
This is what I would consider design aesthetic rather than style. To fix this, you could fill separate units, distinguishable by their different kit and addition characteristics. Alternatively, you could fill them together and foot the bill for the painkillers used to treat the OCD-induced headache that may occur if you are prone to these kinds of things. Again, it's up to you. Common colours. Colours are big. So big, in fact, every miniature needs them. Even if only two in a base colour and a highlight. Let's face it, if you play with unpainted miniatures, you are a complete heathen. Colours can be used just the same as any other distinguishing feature on your miniatures. Colours can solve a lot of your issues, especially when it comes to different manufacturers' miniatures, which may look drastically different despite toting the same race and equipment characteristics. Gotta love them colours. Proxy models. One of my favourite topics in the hobby is proxy models. When you just have to have that unit, but eBay prices are astronomical, or you want to diversify the look of that regiment that only had a four sculpt release. I'm thinking Chaos Dwarf Axemen here. Proxy models are where you go. Not only that, but many proxy models have different equipment and armor, which makes them even more versatile to the budding general. The addition of proxy models to a force can really amp up the look and feel of an army. Your opponents will probably be fascinated as to what you are fielding and where you got them from. Of course, there is the inevitable problem faced with strict tournament rules or particularly picky or competitive opponents. Proxy models, a great way to expand your forces for less. Collections, a great way to collect miniatures is to do so by collections or releases. Often, a release will have numerous different miniatures in distinguishable poses and stances. If you're anything like me and dislike the look of entire units ranked up neatly in exactly the same pose, then you'll probably appreciate collecting by collections. Collecting by collection really appeals to the completist, the keen eBay or trade page watcher, and those afflicted with any kind of compulsive collecting disorder. Personally, I filled units of unique miniatures exclusively, unless going for a specific nostalgic look with monopose plastics, for instance. Collections are clearly where it's at. Quantity versus quality. Instead of worrying about any of the aforementioned, you could simply collect what is rare, expensive, or simply interests you the most historically. There are hundreds of miniatures out there that are unreleased, resin masters or limited editions, and it doesn't take too long to find them with a quick search of so demons or collecting citadel miniatures for the old Games Workshop releases. Nostalgia is another factor that could be considered when collecting. What really ticks the box when looking for new miniatures? Perhaps something that you saw when you were younger and could never have. Something in the right style, or a classic extra-large banner held aloft by a brave knight. Nostalgia meshes quite nicely with proxy models, as sometimes it's seeing something quite unlike anything else, but in an old style that can trigger this feeling. Old school miniatures and nightmare games, for instance, have built their business model entirely on evoking these feelings with beautiful new miniatures. Nostalgia, yeah. Conjugate collecting. Similar to conjugate weight training in that you build all the tenets of strength in conjunction with each other, conjugate collector combines all of the above into a wonderful mess. We've looked at half a dozen or more different specific categories of collecting, and I'm sure there are more, but this is the one that I truly recommend. To collect in this way, you may field a unit using each collecting style, blend several together, or even all of the above to create something really quite unique. A perfect example of this would be my Nurgle army. I have 
three units of metal plague bearers made from each release of the unit type. There were 11 in each release, so in each unit I have added a proxy model in a similar style for the newest release, a Champion of Nurgle slash Chaos Thug in another, and a Chaos Warrior with a Plague Bearer's head to the final unit, to create three units of 12. I have a unit of Nurgle Chaos Warriors made up of the complete release of 12 Nurgle Chaos Warriors supported by three proxy models and a Death Guard Icon Bearer from 40k converted to be a standard bearer. In another unit, I have 12 Blight Kings made up from Heartbreaker miniatures, resins, metal models from Reaper and plastics from the Hate board game. To complement this, I've used the same quickshade glossy varnish and oxide effects across the force, based them the same, and built complementary movement trays, which, when combined, brings the whole force together and makes them look entirely cohesive. In this way, you can create something that looks out of the norm, something interesting and different. This is how Games Workshop thrilled and enthralled a generation of wargamers in the 80s and 90s. Every now and then, a beautiful conversion would appear, standing amongst the rank and file, soloing across the battlefield or crashing through the ramparts of a castle. This nostalgia is what we are trying to create with our armies, a yearning for the good old days, a return to that flicker of excitement when you saw something not quite familiar and you had to search your memory or magazines for where you saw some of those parts before. I guess this is part of the beauty of the hobby for me, trying to keep the old ways alive, not only through my collecting, but also in my efforts here on the channel. The problem with Age of Sigmar. I've never played Age of Sigmar. I'm sure it's very good and all. However, I have no interest in it. The style of the digital art strikes me as lacklustre at best, and enthuses me less and less as I grow older. The design of the miniatures is lazy and uninteresting. The game itself is a game of giant miniatures. Mighty dragons, overpowered cavalry, supreme beings and even gods. This isn't Warhammer. And it's not designed to be. It was designed to drag the player base kicking and screaming into a new world. Something somewhat familiar, but fundamentally different. You can't blame Games Workshop, however. The youth of the early 2000s and 2010s has been fed a diet of instant gratification and instant reward. It can't be surprising that the hobby has had to rebrand itself as a quick pick up and play game that can be polished off in less than an hour. Digital art, the dross of the internet. A whole generation of kids were brought up on the idea that not only could they become famous on YouTube by simply uploading content every day, but also that they could become fantastic digital artists on the plethora of art websites that pander to kids and their drama. This led to a wholesale jump from traditional mediums in the early 2000s, which left us with millions of mediocre digital artists. A trend that passed on to just about every creative endeavour since. So bad was it that during the late 2000s, your project faced miserable failure without a cutesy anime artistic style. During this dark age, places like DeviantArt and similar continued their push for more and more content in an effort to balance their ad revenues with the cost of servers. Other than me lamenting the loss of traditional media to a few stalwarts that hold their ground or standing in quicksand, there isn't much we can do about this. The new Hero Quest game is a perfect example of just what can go so terribly wrong when you fundamentally don't understand the essence of a game, when you redesign and re-release it. 
The miniatures in Age of Sigma are quite unlike that of yesteryear too. The miniatures are, of course, getting less and less miniature. Scale creep has created monstrous entities from what used to be simply modest sized little fellas. Gazkel Thracker is a great example of this. From a lowly pirate-esque figure made of a few grams of lead posing on a small round base in the 80s, to something larger than a dreadnought dominating a base that could easily hold a giant in 2020. Not only this, but the tragic, lazy use of copy-paste and rotate or mirror in CAD makes my soul weep for those miniatures that came before, which were beautifully sculpted from putty and clay. Truly, these were gentler times. Whilst a decent sized Warhammer army used to be a hundred or more miniatures, it is now a fifth of that. Long gone are the days when you can see a game with hundreds of goblins being slaughtered by knights of the realm. Instead, we are limited in scope by the huge creatures of Age of Sigmar and the titans of Apocalypse games, where huge creatures and gods battle it out across an interchangeable backdrop. Whilst everyone loves a centerpiece miniature, you have to draw the line somewhere. You can't simply have the whole army made up of centerpieces, otherwise they aren't centerpieces anymore. Center pieces, which leads us nicely into tactics. The reduction in troops and the concentration on large models leaves us with little to no tactical challenges. A mission that could have been completed by two crack teams of 10 commandos can now be completed by a single invincible robot standing in the open, soaking up firepower from all directions. What the game has lost is nuance. A concentration on more and more powerful weaponry and miniatures that impresses on the battlefield and in the display cabinet. but requires little to no tactical planning or overarching strategy. Interestingly, this has been covered in multiple videos that highlight pricing versus strategic value. A confusing conflation of tabletop value with monetary value. A system that is as horrendous as it is ingenious. Pricing. A truly divisive subject, if ever there was one. On one hand, we have the luxury product. Don't buy it if you can't afford it, team. On the other hand, you have the I would rather buy miniatures from alternative manufacturers or, heaven forbid, recasts to play the game I love. Unfortunately, rarely do these sides meet, as Games Workshop has long held firm to their no proxies or recasts rule in most stores and certainly in tournaments. Whilst I can fully understand the rule in regards to recasts, there is little to no reason other than cornering the market for not allowing proxies. Fascinating as it may seem to some of you sprogs out there, but White Dwarf used to be a haven of heavy metal bands, adverts for other wargaming systems and a whole melange of oddities. Is there really any way out of this though? Games Workshop have noticed a huge gap in the market that they unwittingly created with the death of Warhammer and the birth of Age of Sigma. Something they are now trying to rectify with the rebirth of the old world. A desperate attempt to recover the huge swaths of customers lost to age and scepticism. The old Hammer community, for instance, has grown fat and prosperous during the Age of Sigma. In fact, it seems to have snowballed throughout the pandemic, with many old wargamers returning to the hobby in search of nostalgia. Not only that, but there is a growing gamut of websites dedicated to the old armies and their ways. Chaos Dwarfs Online, for example, is a thriving community that runs regular competitions, has its own podcast here on the channel, and 
is widely respected amongst the wargaming community. The problem with re-releases. There is one thing wargaming companies are past masters at, and that is the re-release. A rules update here, a new sculpt there, some new tiles with flashy digital graphics, and boom, you have a re-release. Games Workshop have done this half a thousand times over the years, new editions of games, of, of course, but also renaming old games such as Gorka Morka, aka Speed Freaks, Warhammer Quest, aka Silver Tower, in brackets, Warhammer Quest, and so on. But there is a lingering malaise that sits unsettlingly upon this phenomenon. These new releases, whilst encouraging us to dream nostalgically about the past, do not fulfil those promises. The original Warhammer Quest, for instance, had a titanic tome of knowledge in its hallowed box, the roleplay book. Now, for those of you that don't remember the 90s, this book was legendary. It had all the rules for including every kind of monster in your games. Rules covering the goings-on outside of dungeons, the purchase of items from merchants, and entire adventures, completely outside the regular game's mechanics of dungeon crawling for treasure. This was a revelation. Not only did you have a full game's worth of content, but you had all the tools you needed to expand the world to your heart's content. Surely, this couldn't continue. Not in today's hump and dump world of pick up and play games, and it didn't. Whilst Silver Tower was surely beautiful, with its flashy dungeon tiles and marvellous miniatures, it had no role play element. Further expansions I cannot account for, as I originally bought Silver Tower to expand original Warhammer Quest. Something I highly recommend. So, for all intents and purposes, this newfangled game is just that. A game. Nothing more and nothing less. Well, that's just about all I have for you today. Be sure to tune in next time for some more gaming content. Thanks very much for watching. Peace.